Trastuzumab emtansine or TDM1 versus capecitabine and lapatinib in HER2 positive locally advanced or metastatic breast cancer previously treated with trastuzumab uh, and ataxane. This will be presented by Dr. Kimberly Blackwell, who's director of the Breast Cancer Clinical Program and professor of medicine at Duke Cancer Institute at Durham, North Carolina. Dr. Blackwell. Well, thank you. It's um, a real honor to be here um, to present this data on behalf of my co-investigators, but also the patients who participated and hopefully the patients that come after them in this study. Um, I'm a, the Amelia study really examined a completely new way of treating HER2-positive breast cancer. So we've known for a long time that a molecule known as HER2, which is overexpressed in one out of five breast cancers, can be an important therapeutic target. Trastuzumab, which is a humanized monoclonal antibody, and it binds to the extracellular domain, the outside of the cell's um, receptor, has been shown to improve survival when combined with chemotherapy, both for the treatment of metastatic and early stage breast cancer. Now, HER2 has been targeted with small molecule inhibitors, such as lapatinib, that bind to the intracellular domain. And lapatinib, when combined with either capecitabine, letrozole, or even trastuzumab has been shown to have clinical efficacy. So trastuzumab emtanzine, which is also more commonly known as TDM1, is a new class, a new way of treating cancer as an antibody drug conjugate, also commonly referred to as ADC. And it's made up of three primary components. Our old friend trastuzumab, an antibody, a potent cytotoxic known as DM1, and this is a chemotherapeutic agent that binds to tubulin, inhibiting microtubulin um, formation, very similar to the vinca alkaloids or the taxanes. And at least in vitro assays, was found to be at least a hundredfold more potent than our old friend paclitaxel. The drug itself cannot be given systemically without a directed delivery mechanism. And the third component of the TDM1 molecule is this stable linker known as MCC, which is critical to this antibody drug conjugate. When DM1 and the linker are actually um, cleaved or lysed off of the antibody, the resulting compound of the DM1 and the linker is known as emtanzine, hence the name trastuzumab emtanzine. And although variable, the drug to antibody ratio is about 3.5, meaning you get about three and a half molecules per of the cytotoxic to each antibody. Now, the clinical efficacy of TDM1 has been um, fairly well studied. There's been two single arm phase two studies in patients who had previously received trastuzumab with objective response rates of about 25 and 34 percent respectively, in each of these two large single-arm studies. And it's really with that background, a novel um, cancer therapeutic, and the activity that we saw in the phase two studies that the Amelia study was designed. Patients were required, um, the target enrollment was 980 patients, and patients in the metastatic setting were required to have seen a taxane and trastuzumab, 100% of patients had received prior treatment with, with both of these drugs. And there had to be documented progression on the trastuzumab in the metastatic setting, or patients must have relapsed within six months of having completed their adjuvant trastuzumab course. Patients were randomized to TDM1, which is given IV once every three weeks at a dose of 3.6 milligrams per kilogram or the comparator or control arm of capecitabine and lapatinib with the dosing shown on the bottom of the slide, pretty standard dosing. This is a, a, a efficient and approved control arm therapy. And when lapatinib was added to capecitabine in HER2 positive breast cancer, it improved progression-free survival by four months, which led to the approval throughout many parts of the world, including the United States, of this combination. There was no planned crossover at the time of progression. There was two study 
co-primary endpoints, that of progression-free survival by independent review and overall survival. And then there was another uh, uh, primary endpoint of safety. There were multiple secondary endpoints, including progression-free survival by investigator, quality of life, objective response rate, and patient reported outcomes. And those will be presented um, more thoroughly at tomorrow's presentation. Here are the primary endpoints of this study. The first co-primary endpoint is progression-free survival. The study met this endpoint with a hazard ratio of 0.65 and a p-value of less than 0 0.0001. This leads to an absolute improvement in median progression-free survival of 3.2 months. The secondary endpoint of the study is shown here, that of overall survival. Now, because there were two co-primary endpoints to the study, the statistical efficacy stopping boundary was set at a very high level based on the number of death events that occurred at the time that the progression-free survival analysis occurred. The overall survival analysis for the Amelia study shows a hazard ratio of 0 0.621, a p-value of 0 0.0005, but has not met its early efficacy stopping boundary statistically, which is set based on the 233 death events at a level of P equaling 0 0.0003. Planned analysis of survival at both one and two years shows a 7.7% absolute difference in overall survival at one year and a 17.9% absolute difference in overall survival at two years. The median survival um, for the Cape Cytobine and Lapatinib control arm is quite good. It, it exceeds that of, of other studies at 23.3 months. And the median overall survival for TDM1 has not yet been reached. So in conclusion, TDM1 demonstrated improved efficacy for patients faced with HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer. There was a statistically significant improvement in progression-free survival and this translated to an absolute improvement in progression-free survival of 3.2 months. The progression-free survival analysis triggered an interim overall survival analysis, and the hazard ratio of the interim analysis is 0 0.621 and a p-value of 0 0.0005, with an apparent benefit in survival to TDM1 over the control arm. Safety and other secondary endpoints, which will be presented more thoroughly on tomorrow's presentation, also favor TDM1, including time to symptom progression and other patient reported outcomes. And there was significantly fewer treatment related toxicities in favor of the TDM1 compared to Cape Cytobine and Lapatinib. Grade three or higher adverse events was 57% for the control arm and 40% for the TDM1 arm and there were significantly more treatment discontinuations in the control arm due to toxicity than the TDM1 arm. TDM1 does have uh, associated adverse events, including thrombocytopenia in approximately 13% of patients, and an elevation in liver enzymes known as AST and ALT that occur in single percent um, of the patients, shown here on the bottom of the slide. Cape Cytomain and Lapatinib did not have any surprising toxicities in the study. There was a high incidence of grade three, four diarrhea and hand foot syndrome, known toxicities for the control arm combination. And so um, in conclusion, TDM1 is a brand new way of treating HER2 positive breast cancer. And I think it is the first of many antibody drug conjugates to follow that will link a potent anti-cancer agent to a targeted delivery system of an antibody. Um, and so I think this will offer a very important therapeutic options for patients faced with HER2-positive metastatic breast cancer. Thank you. I'd like to just make an announcement that um, we thought there might be a couple questions about that trial. Um, and so we brought in another ASCO spokesperson who's an, a breast cancer expert, and that's Dr. Andy Seidman from Memorial Sloan Kettering, uh, who will be here for the question and answer period and, and can certainly uh, provide some context uh, for your questions if you desire. Um, our next study.